Hi everybody and welcome to Photographer's Coffee Morning. I just wanted to do a quick introduction to this week's episode. It's a roundtable discussion again and we're going to be talking to an amazing group of photographers. Today's topics are development and how you grow as a photographer, how you kind of improve over time. And the second half of the podcast is going to be about gatekeeping and its effect on the industry. These are topics that will affect every business, whether you know it or not. So to introduce our panel, we start with Adam Johnson, photographer extraordinaire. He was the founder of the Nine Dots Educational Establishment in the UK, one of the main proponents for education for photographers and has been for a number of years. He's recently stepped away to do his own thing and focus more on his primary business and get back to creativity. We have Nathan and Zoe Chapman, amazing photographers from the United States uh, with a really interesting fine art style. We have Jack Cawthine, he's a photographer and videographer specializing in video and, and stills. He works in the UK again, he's at the beginning of his career, but again, incredibly talented, beautiful work. And last but by no means least, we have Richard Rothmore. He's an incredible architectural commercial editorial photographer and it's well worth checking out their work. If you'd like to see more that they've produced, feel free to use the links in the description. With all that said, let's get on to the conversation. Basically, what we're trying to understand is a little bit more about how you develop your craft, how you get better at photography, how you like pick up new skills and abilities, how you test things out and produce a better product for your client. The reason we call it research and development is if you were launching a new brand of toothpaste, you'd probably have to develop it first. You couldn't just put a random set of chemicals in a tube and see what people think. The idea here is to understand a little bit more how you're intentionally growing yourself to be a better offer for your clients or to better understand what you enjoy in photography. So with that said, does anybody want to start on this conversation about how they get inspiration and how they actively try and develop their own style? Yeah, I'll start um, because I'm still relatively new to the the whole wedding business, like per se, in terms of time and and wedding shot. Mainly for me, um, doing both photo and video, I guess film is where I get a lot of my inspiration from. So um, big, big filmy, did a film, radio and TV um, course at university. Uh, Didn't quite land anything kind of fruitful post university, but um, so much a visual person. Um, I'm not a book kind of guy, so in anything kind of, visual led um hence why you know probably the, the the natural progression into photography and videography um but you know the eight stereotypical you know wes anderson you know very much that kind of that line of of um you know symmetry and just things that look absolutely beautiful um you know and, and t- kind of shows um such as um uh you know breaking bad obviously vince gilligan that kind of stuff they're big inspirations to me um and i guess it's just trying to find ways of eking that into my photography um, and just trying to and videography as well um, and just kind of slowly slowly dipping my toe in to see what works what doesn't work pulling it back okay great you know the beauty of photography and videography is that it's digital so you know unless you're shooting film it's, it's, there's a lot of you know it's not very risk heavy in terms of if you take a shot it doesn't work great you move on you go back to what you know um, so yeah I kind of dip my toe into kind of very much the, the visual led um, filmic uh, kind of angle for my inspiration so you're more thinking about ways to develop your eye so that when you're in a situation you, you kind of have ideas for composition yeah exactly because I'm still I'm still relatively fresh in terms of you know in terms of experience so um, I'm still learning and we're all I'm guessing we're all learning every day aren't we basically so I mean I'm just trying to just see what other people take from inspiration how it's shot angles you know levels let's let's, let's change our eye line let's just move around the scene, move around the subject, not just kind of put them in front of a pretty kind of backdrop and, and take some shots, you know, let's, let's work the scene basically. A little bit like mise en scène and type like that as well. That kind of draw from that inspiration from my film, film days. So yeah, I try to just look at the abstract a little bit more fingers crossed uh, in, in all, all the environments I shoot in. So yeah, that's what I swear I'm kind of drawing it all from. That's interesting. So you're kind of talking about, say, how a director might block a scene, where, as in where you put the camera, where you think different players are going to enter and leave from in a given environment. So obviously in your situation, you're a wedding photographer, videographer, so you may choose to kind of position yourself at at like a 45 degree angle to the bride because it might give a better line on, say, the bridesmaids behind there or like there are you trying to think about how you can stand to better block the scene. And obviously, in the case of stuff like Breaking Bad, that's a lot of really wide angle lenses, the deep depth of field and quite a lot of grain. So those kind of like layering decisions make make a much play a much bigger role, I would have thought. Um, 
it's, it's kind of interesting as well because like Breaking Bad is is a visually like everybody says it's visually striking, but to me, I never really enjoyed the way that 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 show looked. I I always felt like it was very it felt very dirty, and I'm not sure that's something that really appeals to me. So when people talk about that as a source of inspiration, like it, it genuinely did take me a while of like looking at screenshots from it and thinking like where where is the beauty in this? So with that, like when you're actually looking at a scene in, in say a film or a show like Breaking Bad, like what is it that appeals to you? Is it the grittiness or is it more the way that they're trying to layer stuff inside the scene to kind of make that deeper depth of field work? Yeah, I think it's the latter, I think. I mean, you know, even though Vince Gilligan uses a lot of wide angle shots, a lot of his shots feel claustrophobic. You know, the, the way he's layering a scene to, to, to you know, implement his the, the, the tension or the, the emotion he wants to get out of the scene. You know, there's always something blocking. There's something of relevance to push your eye to somewhere that you need to be, even though you're shooting maybe 20, 24, maybe sometimes even wider, um, you know, and, and that layering aspect. And as I say, like the mise-en-scene, everything in your environment is a character. And, and I tend to kind of try and drive that forward in my wedding photography. If I think something's of interest, I'll try and include it in some capacity. And whether it works or not, doesn't really matter because at least I'm pushing my brain and my capacity to think outside the box a little bit and and, and tick off mentally. Great. If it delivers and it lands in the gallery, perfect. If it doesn't, then, you know, it didn't work this time, but maybe I can try a different, different aspect next time and a different kind of approach to it. So, yeah, I mean, definitely the, the whole kind of pushing your eye to where it wants to be um, is definitely where I take inspiration from, from Breaking Bad and the likes of yeah, that makes perfect sense to me. Um, so, with that said, like Richard, obviously you're not you're not in a, a wedding situation most of the time. You mentioned that you've got some new projects coming up, and I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. But before we get into that, as like a primarily an architecture interior photographer, I'm guessing those sources of inspiration are different. But also, I can imagine that development itself would be very different. Um, I know that most interiors photography, to a point, is very volume based, and obviously completely out of your control you can't decide what the environment you're going to be shooting and looks like in a lot of situations so how do you intentionally develop your product your craft sure um you're quite right so every place you're going to is going to be different uh, whether it's a commercial kind of interior offices or uh, whether it's a home so what i was hearing there and interestingly as you experiment with of looking at films into pushing into what a wedding image might look like. There is times where I will try something a bit different, uh, try a, a different angle, different look, and then let it sit in the catalog for a while to come back to it, see if if I'm if I can develop that into a into a series that that catches me. And I think we all uh, have a kind of window of time to edit, but can we look back and see is this a, a look that's going to be worthwhile in time? Um, I had an interesting, it was a film photographer said to, to me recently that when they'd gone from film to the digital, they had this initial reaction of being able to see it there and then uh, that they hadn't had before and judged the image straight away thinking, this isn't great. <laughs> I don't like what I'm producing because the, the, the feeling of what they had had previously was just enjoying the, the process and now they're seeing the image it doesn't represent perhaps what they felt there and then so that's a, a little bit where I will wander around off my tripod a lot a lot of the shoot is based on tripod but I allow myself the freedom now to to take the camera around take some pictures um and try and get out of that box of thinking right here's I'm going to line everything up perfectly I'm going to have this shot and that shot and it comes very easily those those images now but can I find something um, different, more enjoyable, um, and something that's that's not just my monotony of going through those same uh, same looks and same uh, one perspective looks. So that's that's a little bit of where I'm at, at the moment uh, for the interiors and architecture. That's interesting. So you're saying that actually on the shoot, rather than going directly to what most would do, just sticking the tripod in a corner and getting the the, the kind of like waist level ultra wide shot just to show what the room looks like you start out with the freedom element and think, well, no, let's discover. So you have the camera to your eye with the lens on it. You're getting used to the perspective, how that building and that space looks through your lens and try and work out where to kind of then fine tune. But in terms of actually developing and like working out how to do that more efficiently in future, you're saying that you allow the experimentation in the, in the first place, then there's the execution. 
but actually the bit that it in- encourages you to develop is the self-editing side of it. It's when you're looking through your work and culling and seeing like this worked and I want to work on this idea over the course of X amount of shoots. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, it can be tricky because I think like all of us, we know where our money shots are, the shots that are going to please people. And it's easy to go there. For instance, we, if we have a, an interior designer and she's got a stylist there and there's the, the client, whoever else might be there, and I line up a particular shot. And I know that that's a winner to begin with. So I'm going to make them happy. <laughs> I'm going to take the pressure off me a little bit. We, we've produced something that, that they can see is, is worthwhile. And then we might move on to other things. Um, but yeah, so allow, having that um, bravery to go away from just the, the elements that you know are successful, the classics, and go, okay, well, let's, let's try this. Let's try that. Um, and that's, that's where I'm at a little bit at the minute. So to try and blend, of course, providing the, the regular images that when I know that are going to be pleasing, but can I try these? And it might be a case of me saying to the client, um, I'm not sure about this, quite honest. I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see if we can try this, try this lighting setup um, and see if it, if it does come out, uh, if it's something, and, and maybe even ask for their suggestions. If they like a certain something, we will give it a go. Uh, to open up the creative process and, and not feel as uh, caught up in our in our one dimensional shoot as it were just doing it that way i love that because the reason i wanted to talk about this topic was largely because i feel like as photographers we have to develop our style to try and better suit the client that we want and what you just said was like i have my client on set and i ask them <laughs> which i think is great because <laughs> it turns out if you want to make someone happy ask them what they want like mm-hmm. that's always a good place to start um and I also think that if somebody did look through your catalogue of work, you can kind of see elements that are repeating. You can definitely mm-hmm. see times when you've used the same ideas again and again. But honestly, there's also refinement in it too. Like I'm looking at some shots where you've kind of you've got this very like, interesting way of like lining up elements inside of a scene and using doorways to kind of add story and context. Mm-hmm. Like there's a bunch that there's a there's a, a baby's bedroom here. It's got roof on the wall. Like really interesting like showing how you kind of put yourself in the position of the homeowner in that situation and in some cases like actually including people that work in those environments or the designers and stylists and putting a human element in it too mm-hmm. you can see how you kind of had to develop that over time so it doesn't overpower the architecture it's more of a compliment mm-hmm. and i think that's something you do very very well um is that something you're trying to work into more like try and bring more like human scale into your work Yes. And yet I think I've been following the wave of people having blurry subjects in their images. Uh, I had a few uh, crit- crit- crits with some uh, some well-known photographers and they point out they hated it. <laughs> and it was the first time I think I questioned it. I think I've just seen people having these beautiful buildings and we have these uh, blurry people. So we're not drawing attention to the people. Um, but maybe to them it was, it's not real. And that may be the first time I questioned question that kind of imagery as well. So that's that's interesting to get people from different avenues, different photography styles to say, I'm not sure if I like blurry people. I'd, I'd like to see the person. I'd like to see them actually static. Um, and years ago, I remember seeing, um, I forget his name, an Australian photographer, a wedding photographer. And I really liked his images. And I realized in the end why was that he shot a lot of very square images of the places where it was, it could be a building, it could be a forest, it could be wherever he's taken his his, bra, uh, his couple. But he he made them as a small element within it. It was very much environmental portraiture. And that's what I really enjoyed about his work. And as I realize now that I'm, I'm still implementing some of those ideas that I like from decades ago, of seeing that where we're seeing, yeah, the, the scale and uh, there's some life and it's not just, uh, an AI image of a building. <laughs> I, I like that you, you kind of fired that shot as your, your finishing statement there as well. That's, that's a really, I like the controversial take. Uh, so speaking of like film and the change in process and all that kind of thing, like Nathan and Zoe, and I know a lot of your aesthetic is informed by that, that color palette, that film color palette. And I'm really interested to see how you kind of find your inspiration. So could you talk a little bit about how you developed, developed or continue to develop your style? I think like inspiration wise, I tend to focus more on people's emotions. And so that's really where I um, get my inspiration from. So here lately, I think that we've been trying to lean into the imperfections more just because I think that that makes an image more authentic and, and just more them. 
And I think when you're looking back on a picture years from now, like what you want to see is yourself. And so um, for me, that's super important. Um, As far as developing, I think that we kind of have this advantage because a lot of the times we're both shooting in the same situation. And so when we're editing, looking through our pictures, we have these two different perspectives of the same thing. And so we can look at it and be like, oh, like you did it this way. Maybe I should try it this way next time. And so that becomes really helpful. So it's almost like you're saying that you're learning from each other. You're developing based on the experimentation of of Nathan and and Zoe. Like obviously you're doing things that are inspiring him. So, I mean, I think this is something that we talked about briefly on your podcast the other week. Um, The way that you kind of complement each other and you kind of, you're able to kind of, sensor a little bit more you're able to help somebody to develop in a much more organic way because you can be the person saying well I like that but it'd be better if and you're not relying on kind of your own perspective all the time like one of you can be the voice of an outsider and help you to develop a little bit more so in terms of approach are you doing anything proactively to try and give you more room to be able to do that to kind of shorten that that feedback cycle Mm, I don't know if like it's always like an intentional thing um Zoe does all of our editing and you know she'll tell me when she didn't like something that I decided to do in the images and that goes well sometimes other times it makes me angry um but you know I don't do two things (laughs) yeah but uh I don't think that it's necessarily like an intentional like we don't shoot and then each could critique each other's images a lot of times it's even hard for us to remember who shot what image because we don't have specific cameras that each of us use or like anything like that so like throughout a wedding day or an engagement session trade cameras like i may be holding one and i'm like hey I, i want yours now so it gets a little bit difficult there yeah and so like we'll just switch off camera so you have no clue a lot of times who shot what picture at the end of the day so it's really just keeping both of our eyes on it as well as like inspiration zoe and i are huge at we like eat sleep and breathe wedding photography and we do it together so i think it makes it like 800 times worse um where we talk about this 24 7 all the time like dinner lunch breakfast like we discuss wedding photography we look at wedding photographers and so it's this constant battle of pulling inspiration from other people and attempting not to be like, Oh, I wish my images looked like that and getting like down on ourselves in the same, same breath. I mean, that was something that I'm glad that you brought out because I kind of wanted to touch a little bit on this, this kind of danger that comes with doing this. Like if, if um, the only thing you're looking at is like what Jack said, you're looking at just media and you're thinking, well, I want this to look like a TV show. You can fall into the trap of picking inspiration that, that is appealing to you, but isn't appropriate for your application. And the same with wedding photography, you can have the opposite problem. It's that that solution has already been made. Somebody already does that. There is already a perfect solution to the problem for the very rich person that wants to look super beautiful all the time. There, there is an already a perfect solution for that. And if that's all that you want to do, that's not enough, really. You need more. So when you're looking at, um, I don't know, like say, say if you're trying to develop something interesting, something new, you're trying to think about how you can adapt it and do something differently. So the filter that you use to decide, is this for me, is not, is it beautiful? It's, is it saying what I want to say? Is it going to add something to my clients? And it's good doing what Richard said a minute ago and looking at the interaction he has with his actual client and seeing more about what they need and how he can satisfy himself creatively but provide a better product for the person that he's ultimately working for. So I guess like like you said, there's the danger that you can get down on yourself, but from an outsider's perspective, looking at your work, it isn't a me too offering. It isn't something that's the same as everybody else's. So the stresses that you feel when you're going through that pain, just remember that you're developing it for a different person. So when you see the work in which, oh, I wish I could do that, And it's not quite what you want. It doesn't feel quite right to you. So you don't pursue it. Just know that that's part of deciding that you're going to serve somebody else, which is completely valid. And if anything, it's actually a benefit because it means we have another perspective in the industry. And I think that's another advantage to there being two of us in this situation is one of us may be inspired by a different person than the other person is inspired by. Like one of us may have a photographer that we're a huge fan of and the other person doesn't see it. They don't feel the same way about that person's work. And so like, 
while one of us, while we're shooting, may try to incorporate that a little bit. The other person may not enjoy that. And it's kind of that same thing that like tug and pull that gets us to like this specific thing that we have because I want it to go one direction. Zoe's more leaning this other direction and we end up falling somewhere in this mirage of people that inspire us. Well, that kind of makes sense. You're kind of losing a cloud of inspiration as opposed to just like being one thing, like a Venn diagram. There's your interests and Zoe's interests, and when they overlap, you know, you've got something that's pretty good. I kind of wondered, like, so is the are you having like are you having proactive conversations about the direction you want to take? Then, because again, for me, it's not it's not an experience I've had. I've never worked with my space as a photographer. Um, so, looking at that situation, I think, well are you having like direction setting meetings? Like if you were doing product development, are you sitting down and thinking like, no, no. Well, like Nathan said, we kind of talk all day, every day about photography. It's really something that's um, important to us. So we are constantly at lunch, like look at this picture that we took. How do you feel about it? What could you do to make it better? Um, So yeah, I think, like I said, as of late, we've just focused more even than style on emotion um but that might be because we are comfortable with the style of our images already and so it's just like we're not we're more focusing on like the client itself um their self and then just like what image would they want and I think that's that's a really nice thing to be able to say, like to know that you're confident in what you have and you're looking for an evolution and not a revolution. You, you want something small, incremental improvements that just keep getting better and not like, a, like a, an earth shattering like gravity shift. Because again, that's what Richard was saying. He was saying that I, I walk around with the camera and find my direction. When I find it, there's an execution stage where I like I go to work and apply the toolkit that I've built. And then afterwards... I'm using that time to reflect and try and think, well, right, next time, how do I play differently? And I think for you guys, what you're saying is that you you already know when you walk into the room where the tripod's going, you know exactly the direction you're going to take, but you're still doing that work to move the camera just to make sure there's not something you can do to make it 1% or 2% better. But you're not like dangling the camera from the ceiling and trying something completely off the wall because you know what works for you and what your clients appreciate. Which is which is super cool. Um, so that said, Adam, like, obviously we haven't heard from you yet, and I know that um, creativity is massively important to you. Did you have anything you wanted to like to add to this topic? Anything you could talk about in terms of developing your style and how you got to here or where you're going next? Hey, I always feel the pressure with these things. I'm glad you came to me last because I was thinking I don't know what I'm going to say. I don't know what I'm going to say. And then Richard said about experimentation, and realistically, that's where I get the majority of my inspiration from. Is I, you know you and I spend quite a bit of time together Tom so you know you know all this kind of stuff anyway but I am not quite a gear nerd on the same level as you're a gear nerd but I get a lot of it I get a lot of inspiration from the equipment that I use and seeing what it can do and seeing what I can do with it mainly so that I know it so well that whatever I am faced with whatever situation I'm faced with whatever whatever circumstances and conditions I know what it can do and I know what I can do with it. So I personally would encourage anybody to go all in on experimentation and not become too, especially early in careers. You know, I, I've been doing this 12, 13 years now. I would, I would still consider that relatively early in a vision, you know, visual art career, but I don't want, I, even now I don't, I don't want to be defined by overly defined by a style that I stop experimenting because then that's where my work would become stale and i would be bored by it and if i'm bored by it then the then the you know the whoever looks at it's going to be bored by it and then nathan and zoe when you were talking um by the way nathan has the best accent i've ever heard so i'm very glad that that you have a podcast because that that voice and that accent belongs on a podcast um you know you're talking and i i was quickly um sorry but i've never seen your work so I, while tom was chatting to you i was on instagram looking at your work and it's so different to what i shoot and that's amazing you know that you know i looked at it and thought i, I wouldn't that's so different to what i would shoot and i wouldn't even really know how to make my pictures look like that i just genuinely wouldn't and i love that i, I just i just love that this is where uh, you know especially the wedding industry but just for, i just think photography in general i just love that that's where it is these days that you know, me, I do my work a certain way. 
Jack will do his work a certain way and Nathan and Zoe will do their work a certain way in weddings. And all of that fits. All of that can be made to be a really successful business and a really successful, I don't know. And again, I don't know if style is the right word, but that's kind of my uh, opinion on everything that's been said so far. For me, it, it always, and, and hopefully always will come down to the, to be to be an experimental you know like i say whenever me and whenever me and you are together tom we're always talking about cameras and lenses and you're always trying to talk me into getting new gear and i'm always trying to talk you into getting new gear and we we do get a lot of inspiration from that and just to kind of my one final little opinion on this is that that's okay you know it's almost like a, i have one more opinion actually on something richard said i'll just say that before in a minute as well but um it's okay to be inspired by equipment it's okay to think that equipment makes a difference to the work that you're making it's okay to want lenses and you know cool cameras and a lot of us that's what started us off that's what got us into photography is we just thought cameras were really cool and it's okay to keep that and keep hold of that and you know i've bought new lenses recently and it just reinvigorates something in your soul to, to kind of want to go out there and make pictures and just the last opinion richard talked about critiques and how you know, you were doing something in your work with um, moving subjects and blurry subjects and things. And, you know, um, some people, some people listening to this, you know, Tom, talk, I've, I've spent a lot of time in, I hate calling it this, but, you know, like educational side of the industry and critiques have been a big part of that in the last four or five years. But these days I don't really, I don't like it. I don't like critique culture. And I always think, you know, you talked about ha having a conversation with well-known photographers and how they judged um, the moving people and the blurry moving people. And I'm, a, and I'm a big believer that, you know, blurry things in wedding photography is a hot topic right now, especially, but just in general, if you like something, it doesn't really matter always if somebody else thinks that's a good or bad idea, if you like it. And if you believe in it, and if it comes from a place in you that is just, I like that, that's really cool. And I mean, all I'm saying really is, is don't be talked out of it just because somebody on a critique judged it. Um, if it's something that you feel fits and if, you know, there'll be a situation where you think that'll be a, a we talked a couple of people use the word solution. If you think that'll be a good solution to the problem in front of you, the type of image you want to create, just, go, just do it. Like, don't, don't think, although, you know, these people I look up to judged it that one time. So that must mean it's a bad idea. It's interesting you, you said all this because you said that it has been different for everybody and we're all going in different directions, which is part of why I asked this question today because I knew that the people here, even though three of you are in the same industry, none of you do the same thing, like not even close. And that's important. And Richard, like, obviously you're in a completely different industry and still doing things massively differently. So what I wanted to talk a little bit about is, is called accelerated learning. And the idea with this is that rather than looking at an industry and emulating somebody, you're trying to build something. It's like a, it's like a positive feedback loop. If you ever learn how to teach, they talk about this as like a baseline thing. Imagine a circle split it into four quadrants. You've got experiencing where the new things are happening, reflecting where you're thinking about what, what just happened to you. So Richard talking about his reflection on his calling, thinking, Nathan and Zoe like talking together and trying to actively decide like what's happened here, like mull it over as a group, acting where you change a practice to find out what ex what result it has and you experience it again. And the more often you follow that loop, the more you'll change, the more you'll improve. The reason it's called accelerated learning is because there's a million other ways to learn. But if you force yourself through this process again and again and again, that's how you develop things authentically. So what you try and do is put yourself in as many situations as possible where you can lean into that. And most of us have resistance over different elements of that cycle. So for me, acting is the most difficult part. Like for me to go out and take a photograph takes more effort than me reflecting on what I did, experiencing it or thinking about what I'm going to do next. Because for me, those other three elements of the cycle are fascinating. So being able to look at that and think, oh, I love these bits. That means I need somebody to push me to act which might mean that you need an accountability partner. You might need somebody to try and help you to kind of go out and have more confidence so you feel like you can do these things. You might have to go and decide that you want to do a styled shoot or you might want to get speak to a couple and see if you could shoot them for free or you might start photographing an interior for a place that you would find challenging intentionally. But the idea is that if you're like me, you have to seek out experiences that push you 
through the acting stage of the cycle, otherwise you never grow. But if you're the kind of person that acts, 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 acts all the time, and you will not give yourself a chance to stop and think about what's just happened, you're not going to grow either because you're just continuing to repeat the same action again and again and again. So the lovely thing about hearing everybody talk just then was the fact that you literally all covered that cycle and all of you covered different parts. So Jack, you kind of minimize acting like I do. You talked about kind of reflecting and thinking and then maybe talked a little bit about experiencing, but mainly it was about conceptualizing what you wanted to do and like reflecting on how successful it'd be. Um, Richard, you were very active and you talked about the experience and the, the process of doing it and reflecting on it, but you didn't necessarily dwell heavily on thinking about how you could change things. It's, it became intuitive for you. And Nathan and Zoe, between the two of you, you actually covered all, th all four. And I don't think it's a mistake that as a result of that, you actually are 100% happy with where you're at because you, you've probably grown faster as a result of being able to have both of you pushing that cycle round again and again and again. And if anything, it sounds like for the two of you, the issue is trying to align on something that you're happy with and continue down that route and not have one of you disrupt this positive learning cycle. Um, all this to say that that's, that's quite a fancy way of saying that if you keep doing stuff and thinking carefully, you'll probably get to where you want to be. Um, but I just thought that was really cool that all of you are people that I would consider to be creative and like definitely experimenting visually and doing the stuff that I enjoy to enjoy looking at. And to hear you all talk about the different elements, this process that you love is really refreshing. It, it did lead me onto a separate topic though, because one thing that can happen is that everybody here has mentioned looking at other photographers and seeking advice and Adam touched on it earlier. Um, it's the topic of gatekeeping and this can be looked at two different ways. So for those that don't know, gatekeeping is a practice of trying to make sure the skills you have stay scarce. So you might choose to not tell somebody what camera you're shooting with, or you might not disclose the information for the vendor that helped you to source the the cushions that you've put in your in interior. You might choose not to talk to somebody about how but the, the kind of networking groups that you go to or anything else. It's the practice of protecting your competitive advantage at somebody else's expense, essentially. And it gets a bit of a bad name and for good reason, because I don't think there's anything positive about any of those things that I just said. And I just wondered if you guys have ever had an experience or either feeling like you've had to gatekeep and what, what led to that, or being kept away from knowledge that would have helped you to grow faster if you'd have known it sooner. And I know that within our, our industry, there, there can be... Um... The thought there's a lot of people going into shooting interiors and architecture right now is quite appealing. Um, and I'm keen to share with whoever and rely upon having a great relationship with my clients and just enjoying that and hoping that that's enough <laughs> to keep me in work. And so I'm happy to share, uh, whether it's just a new photographer, I had a chap contact me the other day, just said he'd really like to be able to do more. So he's going to come for a coffee and whatever I can do to share, um, whether it's some of the editing process, but I'm aware that um, there are those that do keep it very close to the chest, uh, who, it, who edits their images, uh, who does their publishing and uh, like all their not publishing, their connections with the publishers and gets them in and who knows who they keep that close to them. But I feel like I haven't had an awful lot of help from anyone. So I'm just keen to help whoever I can when they come along <laughs> with the hope that they don't take as long to, to get to where I am right now, <laughs> that they, they might get somewhere as well and enjoy, enjoy working in the industry. Good on you, man. That's a really good way to look at it. Like nobody gave you a leg up. So you're the first one to have a handout ready. That's good. Yeah, I try. Yeah, at least. <laughs> How much help that is, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe the walk away thing. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I guess that the fact is that you're willing to share, because one of the things I wanted to point out was that we've all talked about these learning cycles that we've been going on and how hard it's been for us to develop the styles that we have and how much effort, attention, how you're kind of pushing yourself through all this discomfort to try and grow and grow and grow. And yet, if you think about it from the point of view of somebody that's got a bit of a scarcity mindset, somebody that's trying to hold on to something that's that's theirs and they've, they've fought so hard for, you can kind of understand why. Because if you go back to the research and development analogy that we started with at the beginning, it's sort of like you've put all the, the effort into developing Coca-Cola and Pepsi want the recipe. And 
people use phrases like gatekeeping and it can be quite a harsh term. And personally, I don't particularly believe in it. I'm quite happy to tell you anything you want to know about anything. So if you ever ask me something, you'll get a full and honest answer. And for anybody that has asked me a question, you've probably had too much information and you've probably regretted asking me. But the the point being that I'm happy to share information with people. But equally, I've had situations in the past where that's definitely burned me. So especially early in my career, I started out teaching workshops for Polaroid. Um, basically, that they had a film that didn't work. So I developed like ways of shooting it so that you got an image out of it at the end, rather than just having like a literally the film used to rust over. So it was like literally a rusty mess instead of a Polaroid. Um, so over time, I kind of developed like the, the best practice. I used all the kind of old film cameras and find out the ones that generally still worked and which one gave you like the best bang for the buck and all the rest of it and started shooting um, workshops, essentially, and, and started shooting some com small commercial projects only on Polaroid um, until somebody came on the course and within a week had set up a business doing exactly the same thing. Now, you could argue that I should have a skill that's so protectable and so unique that, that there is no substitute, but we work in a technical industry. So when you think about it from the point of view that, yes, nobody can capture your eye, but there are definitely some things that you do that somebody else would find so valuable that giving that information away could be a detriment to you. And I just thought it was an interesting conversation to have because like Richard said, like nobody helped him. And it makes you wonder, like, is, is there something in that industry that's being protected? Have people, do people feel like they've fought so hard and they need to keep hold of this stuff? And if we feel like that, is there a way that we can make ourselves feel a little bit more open to sharing information and maybe feel comfortable? I think it's a good topic. I think it's a good topic, and but I think it's it's. Uh, I think a lot of people would have a lot of different views on it, and I, I've got obviously experience over a number of years of teaching workshops and teaching a large number of people how I take the pictures that I do, and or how you you know how how I've achieved a certain style or look or whatever. I don't know that I, I don't know that I can say for sure that that hasn't affected my business. I don't know for sure that I can say that that hasn't affected the bookings that I'm able to get or on that level, but it's definitely at times affected how unique I feel as a photographer because you're, you're teaching a lot of people how to do things the way you do it. So clearly that's going to dilute your uniqueness in the in a visual sense you know in it just in the in a in a way that things look not necessarily in the way that the things feel because I, i've you know I, w I hope i've never been a gatekeeper in this way and i'd never heard this phrase actually until earlier when you mentioned it tom but the you know if somebody asks me what lens i took a picture on or, or what cameras and lenses i'll use i'll happily tell them because that's the, that they can achieve nothing with that information um if they ask me, you know, other technical stuff, then, uh, you know, I'll happily share that kind of stuff because it's not the technical stuff that it, where pictures come from. It's actually just on a quick tangent. I was thinking about this this week because I've seen another like mini resurgence in film in kind of people shooting on film recently. And obviously I'm, a, I absolutely adore film, you know, this and I've shot film in the past and I, I would say that, it's, it's, it has been huge for me in in achieving how my images look now and how I take pictures now. Um, I'm heavily inspired by film, but um, you know I see people shooting film and yet yeah, and so showing how cool it looks, but almost allowing film to be the style. You know, almost allowing the style to be the the fact it's a film photo. It, but in real in reality, that means that anybody else who picks up that same film camera and, and puts Ektar one hundred in it or whatever can take the same picture, can can take exactly the same picture, and the same thing applies to digital. And you know, our, our photography has to be about way more than the, than just the, the 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 where we put the sliders in Lightroom and the lenses that we attach to the camera and that, all that kind of stuff. But in in terms of in in general holding back holding stuff back uh i think i would i would say probably it has affected my my own photography business and my ability to get bookings having taught so many people the way that i do it over the over the over the last six seven years you know hundreds of people so 
Um, I can see why, again, I, it, it, there is an element of gatekeeping. I think it's worse at the moment than it's ever, than it's been for a long time, just because I think it's a, it's a cycle thing. So, you know, go back to going, probably to go echoing what Richard's saying. And if I'm waffling, top, just cut me off at any point. But the, you know, when I started out, 2010, 2011, there, no, there was no help, really. There was no real community. There was no there was no willingness f- of, between photographers to help each other out with their businesses, with their photography or, or anything. So then you get into kind of 2014, 2015, 2016, and that became the it became the exact opposite. So you had people like me and and many many other people offering workshops, making YouTube videos, you know, creating. A, an incredible amount of educational content and then community over competition became the buzz the buzz phrase so everybody wanted to help everybody and i just think in the last year or two and maybe it's a you know maybe it's a since 2020 thing i don't want to use that word but um maybe it's just that people are a little bit more protective again because the cycle w- goes round and the and the community the community of a competition mantra um has become a little bit thin and a little bit meaningless and also people are probably thinking you know i'm, I'm str- i've been really helpful and now i'm struggling for bookings maybe the reason i'm struggling for bookings is because i've been really helpful so i just wonder whether that's i don't know whether this is the reason you brought it up or, or, but i wonder whether that's the reason there is a bit more gatekeeping in and around the industry at the moment and I don't know where, where, where that'll end, but the cycle will go round again. And cause that's just the way cycles work, you know, they go around, but the, uh, but I just to, just to, the, the, the quick answer to your question is I, pr- I think probably having taught so many people, one, it's affected my business and two, it's affected my own perception of my ability to make unique photos, but that, but then that pushes me to experiment more. So it's, it kind of goes back in to what you was, we were talking about in the first half of this, in the you know and i've always said this you know i've taught workshops and then people who've been on my workshops have then taught workshops themselves saying exactly what i've said in my workshops which is a little bit you and me were having this conversation the other day tom you're just gonna you have to accept that as almost like a not very nice side of 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 sharing sharing knowledge again this room full of people is is basically you're all here because you're all doing something differently and the fact is that if we'd all just followed what adam was doing we'd all have images that look like Adam's, but we wouldn't know why. There'd be no heart to it. There'd be no reason for it. You could tell me exactly what camera you use, the lenses you attach to it and everything else. I won't be, I won't be able to take images that look like yours because your images come from, a, from somewhere inside of you that I don't possess personally and vice versa. I, I think if I handed you everything I own and told you exactly what I do, I don't think you'd be able to make images that look like my images. So that's where, you know, Zoe talked about it earlier about, making emotion uh, a key a key element of their style um mo- cap- the way you capture a mo- especially as wedding photographers the way you, the way you capture a moment is 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 way more important than what you're capturing that moment with so all the 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 less tangible you know if if coke gave pepsi the the the, the recipe to, to coke pepsi could make coke and it would be identical we we can give our entire recipes over to somebody else and they will not make the same drink with 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 that recipe they just won't because they can't because they because we didn't come with it like this is so this is i think this is just something that and this is why you know gatekeeping shouldn't exist is because we you could never give the the final secret ingredient that that is in your images because you don't really know it it's because it's it's your soul and that's yeah that that's been a, a key a, a key reason of why i've shared so much over the years and will continue to do so and you know i i do a newsletter and a podcast and neither of those are behind a paywall and the reason for that is i just love helping other people and again i just want to reiterate i'm definitely not pro gatekeeping this is not the point of this conversation like i, I just think it's interesting to talk about it because I, I think that what adam said about seeing a shift in the way the industry's working is something that's definitely happening i'm seeing fewer people sharing openly what they're doing like more people being aware of the fact that their business needs to have a separated position i was i was thinking as well the effect of gatekeeping we might think of the the people the inexperienced user 
um, and the effect on them. But there is also an effect on the experienced person by gatekeeping, isn't it? I realize that with some some photographers I know uh, and have been in the industry 30 or more years. And they'll come to me, despite being far more successful, uh, having uh, you know, be on regularly on the front of Architectural Digest and LDEC or whatever it might be, still saying, what are you using? What, what, what gear do you use? What? And I realized that because you've been so insular and kept so much of the things to yourself, there is the worry about what other, pe- other people are doing and doesn't create this healthy atmosphere of, of people that have the interchange of, of ideas uh, between different levels of experience, different parts of people's careers. And so, I, yeah, there's not a, a positive necessarily <laughs> to either set to either group, is there? You're stuck in your own little realm. There's, there's no way you could know what other people are doing if you're intentionally blocking yourself off from other people and refusing to share or to learn from anybody else. It's a, it's a two-way street. The reason why I titled this episode Development and Gatekeeping is largely because I wanted to remind everybody that if you ever feel like you have something to share, it is worth sharing it. Like if you feel like you do something and you don't see other people doing that, there is value to it because it means that either somebody doesn't know how to do it and would benefit from learning, or it could be something so unique to you that it's a point of like competitive difference because nobody else will do what you're doing. Like they're not ready to kind of put that level of effort or energy or attention into it. If you look at education without development, you can end up in a situation where you end up being really good at something that doesn't feel very good to you. Like Nathan and Zoe, can you imagine if you were forced to kind of shoot dark, like moody pictures all the time? I don't know if I could. So it's crazy because you see the beauty in all the different styles. Like you can see it. Like when you look at different pictures, you can see what's appealing and you can see why they're special in their own way. But like, like you guys mentioned, like, when you're creating it's about your own soul and putting that in there and no one else can do that i think tom like you talked about this on a little bit on uh the podcast you did recently with photoco with miles and you talked about online education and this idea of like information being available and how there's that statistic that you know 90 something percent of people who buy an online course, who try to go through some kind of online course are never going to get past the beginning of it. And I think I would go further to say that then out of the 10% close to that do go on and finish the course, 90% of those people never actually implement the information that was given to them into their own business or into the way that they shoot. And I think that that's The thing is, is that you can be willing to give all the information that you want. And I think it's one thing like against hiding information is the fact that, you know, a lot of times people aren't going to implement it. They're most likely not going to implement it the same as you would. It's going to be very, very, very difficult for anybody to implement something that you do in the way that you do it 100% the exact same, even if you wrote it out in the most detailed instructions that you possibly could. And because it comes back down to, especially in something creative like photography, that it is you taking that image. Even if someone shot a style very similar to Zoe and I, certain clients are not going to react the same way to things that we say as the other people's clients. They're not going to connect to us in the same way that they did the communication style of someone else. So even if they said the exact same things that we did, they're not me and they're not my clients and they're not going to react in that same way to be able to create that image. There's too many variables to be able to copy everything down to the exact T. Well said. That sums it up perfectly. And I think that this this is... um, this entire topic is a strange one for me to talk about, to be honest, because I've been on both sides of this equation. I think if we're being honest, I think we all have at some stage. Someone has asked us for information and we've either not been in the right frame of mind or not wanted to invest the time into sharing that. But I think quite rightly, the entire industry is better when we do. But if we are in a situation where we're all willing to share information in some way, shape or form, make it available and not actively protect people the information that we have or dissuade other people from reaching out in the industry, we have a better industry for it. The only times I can think I've ever come across gatekeeping have been catastrophic for me. The kind of things like commercial photographers never talking about licensing because they don't want to, they don't want to have the competition and they realize that without licensing fees, there's a good chance you're never going to make enough money to continue. 
um, agencies that won't bring that kind of information out because essentially they benefit by not having to pay your licensing fees. This is a very specific example. And actually, it's partially because I had a conversation this morning with a producer that's working actively to try and prevent that kind of stuff from happening. Um, so if you want to hear more about that, there'll be another episode that drops like just after or just before this one, depending on how editing goes. Um, but that conversation really did make me think about how damaging it was for my career when that information was withheld. It was years of stunted growth and not months. So for anybody out there that's on the fence and not sure what to to do, I would just recommend that if you feel you have something to contribute, do it. We want to hear from you. Well, I was going to say, like, it, about the whole concept of gatekeeping and, and education and the whole point of what Adam touched on, you've touched on, Tom, and Nathan and Zoe as well, is the fact that, that you give, you educate for hope, right? You know, you hope these people will take the information you've given them and they will come and create something of their own value, which will then progress them. And hopefully you can take inspiration from that as well. And you, that cycle then will repeat and, and come back, you know. I mean, these people aren't creating lenses like Sony, Canon. They're not creating these things just to be sitting on a shelf. They're, they're creating these things to be used. And they're hoping that you are going to go out and better their product by taking amazing images, amazing videos, and just progress down the line. So, I mean, gatekeeping to me is such an odd concept because I'm just an open person. I like to just have conversation discuss like adam like yourself tom you know we always i'm always asking you questions etc etc because i know that i'm going to get an honest answer and someone is not going to withhold information from me and, and you're going to give me your honest opinion uh, and that's to be valued you know that offers a gives you a place in in in, in my life and my stature to think oh that's someone i can trust you know adam's courses if you're going to go on it you know you can trust them the process because this is a guy who's thought about this day in day out Year, you know, since 2010, 2011, has really, you know, curated and nurtured his craft. And what you do with it is up to you. But what Adam's provided you is sound information that they can hopefully take away and progress and better themselves. And that hopefully will come back cyclical and you can take something from them in the future. I love that, Jack. Well said. And um, obviously, the, this that's part of the reason why we started this round table up again, because... I really want to make sure that for anybody that does feel like they don't know where to turn to, we want fewer people to be in the situation that Richard was in, to feel like nobody gave me a hand up, nobody taught me how to do this, nobody supported me, nobody was there to help me. We want to have a room full of people that are willing to talk about anything as an open book and not put a front on, not wait to try and pitch you something, just literally just be there to have a conversation with you in the time we have allotted, the time we've, we've chosen to give to this. And you can take as much as you want from it. It's like it's like a buffet. Like feel free, fill up. That's what we're here for. And if you want to be part of the conversation, we want you in in this conversation. Whether you're year one and you've got a fresh perspective, and we can take advantage of that, or you've been doing it thirty years and you've got insight that we don't have and need. The the fact is that somebody in this room may say something that's pivotal to your development. It's that one thing that was preventing you from like leveling up to the next stage in your career. And it's unlikely you're going to know what that is ahead of time. So if you're on the fence about filling out the contact form and like signing up for one of these conversations because you feel like you don't have anything valuable to say, I just encourage you that nobody has your perspective. That's exactly what Adam's been saying up to now. The thing that you can't give away is your unique perspective. So if you want to talk from the heart about the way you do things, that is just as valid as the way that anybody else has chosen to do something. And if there's a more optimal practice, cool. We might both learn something. But the fact is that if you if you feel like you don't have that community, that is what this is for. If you are in a situation where you're butting heads and you're feeling frustrated that you aren't growing as fast as you want to, sometimes it's just having a conversation openly about those struggles that can help you to get past it. What goes around comes around. So if you if you if there's going to be a time when we all need help. So I try and think of it that by by me being helpful, when my time comes that I need some help, people will help me. Second thing is a great quote that I heard from some photographers uh, in Indonesia called The Uppermost. And it's kind of about this whole uh, gatekeeping mentality. So one, their, their kind of um, belief is that you have a finite amount of space for knowledge. And if you hold on to the knowledge that you've got you then that space is full but every time you pass the knowledge on you're freeing up space 
for new knowledge. So you can fit, you can fill up your own knowledge space and keep at, keep hold of that and hold it tight and, ne- and never tell anyone. But that means you aren't you aren't um, receptive to, to learning new things. So you're only going to become stale with that attitude. And just the final one, and it's maybe a little bit controversial and a little bit of a different angle. So I don't, I don't, what I don't want to do is create this um, expectation that everything should be free and everybody should share everything they know uh, across the board because I don't think that's fair. So, yes, stuff like this is amazing. Stuff like this where creative people can come together and talk about stuff openly and help each other. It's brilliant. But it shouldn't be expected that, you know, I'll use myself as an example, but that anybody can can contact me and say, okay, tell me everything about how you shot this image or tell me everything about how you shoot weddings because I think that was, that would be unfair. <laughs> that would definitely be unfair. Not holding not holding stuff back is is important, but at the same time, you can't expect everybody to just give you the leg up and give you the hand up. You know, you've got to respect that person's time. You've got to respect the the dedication and the years and hours and you know turmoil, mental turmoil that's gone into uh, becoming the artist and photographer that that person is. If you if you're looking up to them and hoping that they'll share their knowledge with you, sometimes there's going to be a charge for that, and that's okay. And actually, on the charging side of it, that's largely because you need to be able to recoup your time. Like if you're if you've gone to that effort and you're actually making education quality, and you're not just saying, oh, "I use this camera and this lens," the second you start getting into rationale and being like, "Well, this is why I chose this," and looking at somebody else's business and trying to provide a coaching service, that isn't the same thing as just not withholding information when asked. One of those two practices requires like skillful direction. It requires an art of teaching and it requires that you dedicate time to somebody else's business advancement at the expense of your own. And I think that that is a really fine line. That's It's an important thing to distinguish. So there's being asked a question and not saying, no, I'm not telling you. And there's being asked a question and not only giving a full answer, but explaining exactly how it can slot into their business or why it shouldn't. Like those two things are clearly not the same. And you may find that somebody who is an educator might be generous and go ahead and do that and say, like, look, here's how it slots in. And you may like really benefit from that information. But if we aren't willing to pay people for that kind of knowledge, you're not going to get people with the time to do that very long. Because the fact is that if I'm if I'm teaching, I'm not shooting. And if I'm shooting, I'm not teaching. So you need to one way or another, there needs to be an equalizing. Otherwise, I'm starving. And I'm using me as an example, but obviously I'm not the only example here. There's lots and lots of people the world over that might want you to kind of talk to them about photography. They might want to tell you what they, they know, but in the end, if you aren't willing to compensate them, they, they won't be able to continue to do that very long. So I, I definitely see what you're saying. You're trying to ad- advocate for balance in this, that don't be the kind of person that will never share anything, but be aware that your time is still valuable. And if you are going to share something, there is a value to what you're sharing. Does anybody else have anything they want to ask or to add on the topic of development, gatekeeping, or actually education in general as we come to now? Many things, but in the interest of this not being many days long, uh, I'll, I'll I'll hold them back for, for the future. I think I was in the same camp. I was like, open a can of worms. Because <laughs> that's the thing. Like the, the whole thing here I'm supposed to do is dangle the carrot and say, well, the next round table is going to be about... I wanted to say a huge thank you to everybody that's come today. And thanks again for listening in, everybody that has. With that said, we'll see you all next week. Goodbye.